It's a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Meir Horden to the JCPA. Rabbi Horden was born in 1964 in the United States. He holds an MA in Agriculture from Hebrew University and was ordained as a rabbi by the Chief Rabbinate in 1997. Since 1999, he has served as the Orthodox Rabbi of Stockholm. Rabbi Horden is going to speak today about the Jewish community of Sweden and its challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think some time passed. It was, just, it was just maybe August when Manfred and myself, we met in Stockholm. It was actually a bar mitzvah of two Jews that originally coming from India. That were married, that was their first son that had a bar mitzvah. And the community is not based only today on Jews that were born in Sweden. There are a lot of Jews coming from different places. We'll discuss that, of course, later. So, a little bit about the Jewish community. We'll start with the, by the order. By order. Jewish community in Sweden today is built by, on three major communities. Stockholm, there are 4,000 members and 4,500 members in the community. And there are at least 10,000 Jews in the city. In the area of Gothenburg, that has 1,500, and there's at least double numbers around the area of Jews. In Malmö, the same, about a thousand members are left, and there's at least 2,500 Jews at the center, the southern part of Sweden. So, if we talk about official numbers, people are speak, speaking about 15 to 18,000 Jews in Sweden, and maybe only half of them are members of the community. How many Jews are there in Sweden? It's a good question. My predecessor said he estimated 100,000. As you run again and again to people who said, oh, my mother, my grandmother was Jewish, but we don't practice anymore. And I know personally of so many families that, of survivors that came after the war. We'll talk about Sweden's role um, hosting or what they did in the war maybe a little later. But a lot of these Jews said, I don't want to have anything more with Judaism. A lot of women came after, there were gr teenager girls or women that were coming afterwards. Sweet, there were nice Swedish men that helped them. They decided to get married with them, and they totally disappeared. So the real numbers, we don't know. I guess it's not the only place in Europe, but in Sweden, we know that there's a lot of Jews that maybe are halakhically even Jews, but they don't practice, so they totally disappeared. So this is a little bit about the numbers of the Jews in Sweden. The community is built in a unique way, and that is that all the mainstreams, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, have, uh, we'll say, in, are, are placed in the same community. Meaning that we are in the same building, there's, a cons there's not, no Conservative rabbi now, but there was a Conservative rabbi, the Orthodox rabbi, the Conservative, we all sit in the same building, we're under the same community, there are disadvantages, and that's clear, but there are a lot of advantages. And advantages is that I can reach out to every Jew in the community. If there's only 5,000 around, 6,000 to reach out to, so I can reach out to all the Jews there. And for example, this year in Hachshavav Nakiva, there are about 16 youngsters only from Stockholm, and that's a record. For many years we didn't have so many, and most of them are not coming from Nakiva houses or Orthodox um, houses. They're coming from, and they come close to, to Zionism and Judaism through that, that we can reach out to every Jew in Sweden, and I think that is the, a great advantage. <coughs> so this is generally about the community. The community is very active in different fields. There is a Jewish school, about kindergarten, that only has 200 children there, 250. There's a Sunday school, another 150. The Jewish school runs to sixth grade. There's a junior high with another 100 children afterwards. And there's no Jewish high school. And, but there, are, of course, are lectures, and about 80 children come once a week. It's called Relin, and they come once a week we we'll hear another lecture in Judaism. There's a summer camp beautifully located. We're now in half 
lots of Stockholm, Lemsta, it's, you know, you're familiar mm -hmm. with the place. And the Jews, uh, I think, the, um, it's, it traces back to 100 years. And there are children that their great grandfather already went to Lemsta. And um, it's a place with a lot of memories and a beautiful place to have a summer camp. Starting with the Jews in Sweden. If we trace, the history isn't so long because only in 17, 1775, the, the third, King, uh, Adolf III, um, Gustav III, Gustav Adolf III, he permitted the Jews to enter Sweden as Jews, meaning to build a community and the first Jew landed in that year. Before that, if Jews came to Sweden, they were forced to convert or change their religion to Christianity. So the first year was 17, 1775. From those Jews that landed in the first 70, 100 years, there may be 10 or 20 Jews still left from these major families, meaning there's a real assimilation in Sweden. The first families totally disappeared. None of them are almost left. The names are well known in Jewish, in, in Swedish society. The, the newspapers, born your families, because you're familiar with these families, and others are very famous. But however, they, their descendants aren't Jews anymore. So if we think about that, most of the Jews that are active today, they are survivors survivors that are coming after 45 or Jews that were coming in the beginning of this last century. Jews that were coming before totally disappeared. So out of the 4,500 Jews, I would say only 1,500 are somehow active. 3,000, I even don't know why they're members. They're members because some solidarity with Israel, with the Jews in general, and uh, I guess they want to have the burial in a uh, Jewish cemetery. But there are about 1,500 till 2,000 from this number that are active, meaning showing up in, doesn't matter what activity, but in something in the community. So this is generally about the community, the structures, the members, and the activities. What are the major challenges today. So the challenges today I would say that the communities are declining. Whatever happens is the generation of the survivors. They are disappearing. Those that built the Jewish school, there was a great debate in the 50s if to have a Jewish school at all or not. The Jews that came before the war were totally against having a Jewish school. And um, at the end, there were some Jews that forced and pushed for the Jewish school today. These Jews, I would say, are the ones that pushed the community forwards and made it as a more Jewish type. Jew they, they were proud Jews, comparing to the Jews that were pretty assimilated, um, the ones that were coming in, for generations before. So these, I would say these, um, challenges are happening that this generation, these Jews, I would say about 100 to 120 funerals every year in the community, meaning those active Jews are disappearing slowly. Of course, there's a more positive side, and that is youngsters that are moving to Israel and Aliyah, and that we all are seeking for. And um, I would like to say that it feels great that so many youngsters that I, in the last nine or ten years that I know, and of course there were many of them much before, that were making aliyah and moving, getting married and building a house here in Israel. And we always have this, I would say, dilemma, what is more important, to straighten the, the community of 4,500 Jews in Sweden, or that the stronger part of the community will move to Israel, the youngsters that have that are really more interested in Judaism, more active, what is better? Should they stay there and contribute to the community or move to Israel? Bo Hashem, we have five over five million 
Jews in Israel today, maybe it's important to keep another thousand Jews in Sweden. But even though that we have this dilemma, I am sure that it's more important to move to Israel, to raise their families in Israel. And we know the difficulty of youngsters to find, find their love in between the members of the community. It happened, and it happened sometimes. Last year we had about 10 weddings, that was a lot. But for the m many years I had two or three weddings a year, meaning that there is a lot of mixed marriages. The numbers are around 80, 90, 80 percent at least. And um, some of them go through a conversion, some don't. But of course this influences the community. This is a challenge that the community has to go through. It's not the same community like if I were to take a Jewish school, or another dilemma that we have, what type of children should we accept in the school? And in one rabbinical conference, I said that I prefer, even that, even though I'm the Orthodox rabbi, to have a school with not all the children will be halakhically Jews, than having a school of 10 children or five children in a class. I was offered, I was offered a few years ago to be the rabbi of Basel, so I came down and saw her, a school with five children in every class. And I said that, of course, all the rabbis were pretty upset. How can I say something like that? We have to see that all the children are halakhically Jewish. But one of the, one of the wives of the, one of the rabbis there came up, said to me, you're absolutely right. My child had, it was totally a catastrophe to be in a school with five children. If two children don't get along, and you know, it's a class you can't live with. And I do think that today it is also a mitzvah to keep those that, even though the father is Jewish, the mother isn't, to keep them in some type of surrounding, Jewish surrounding. And a lot of these children do want to convert halakhically. The conservative movement do, does it before the bar mitzvah a little quicker. We do it when they're 16, 17, but we help these children that want to convert to Judaism afterwards to do it. I think that is a very important thing. It's one of the challenges we do have today in small communities. So there's a lot to discuss about these matters too. I would like to, I don't know how many minutes I have still. No, fine. I'm fine with the time. So another challenge of course is to build and part of the activities that I was investing is to build a new generation. We had this I think it's all Scandinavia, a gap between the elder generation, the survivors, the grandparents, I would say, and the children, because the generation, the middle age generation, well, those that are between 30 and 50, they're not so active anymore. Those that are more religious or more Zionist, they move to Israel. Those that are left in the communities, they're pretty weak. How do we get the youngsters more involved again? What happens to a rabbi that he starts his job and suddenly, after three or four years, half of the synagogue almost disappears? Why did it disappear? They passed away or they moved to Israel. And there we started with different projects to teach the youngsters to lead the services by themselves. And I invested a lot of time with that. We have about 30 youngsters that can read the Torah today. They know how to lane. The girls get to be active. They give the sermon instead of me. So we succeed to have these youngsters active and um, that brings not only the youngsters but it brings also the parents and the grandparents and it's a way to keep a community alive because I can read the portion much easier than teaching the, young, uh, the others but however I think it's very important to invest with the, the future and the future is there with the youngsters. The younger generation are, I would like to say, we have a, one representative here from that generation. They're very proud Jews, much more than their parents. I mean, meaning that they are much more, they have a stronger Jewish identity sometimes. They want to show, that they're not scared to show the Judaism out to society. And I think there's a much difference, there's a great difference between the younger generation, I said to 25, 30, till the generation before that maybe was brought up in a different atmosphere. So this is a little bit about 
the community, the challenges that we are going through. In the religious aspect, we have another, I, I, th I think it's a blessing, but for different communities in Scandinavia, they're very scared that Chabad came in to the different communities around the world. Um, I know different rea rabbis react in different ways. There's one of the rabbis in Scandinavia that's still very active that doesn't want to hear about Chabad and puts them aside and mm -hmm. says that we should even boycott, I would even use that word, they can have nothing to do with the community. My opinion is more positive, meaning Chabad has beautiful things they do with outreaching, with teaching, with different things, different activities. I was positive for Chabad coming into Sweden or to Stockholm. However, I would say we have different opinions, and different opinions have to do with the way of Zionism, the, the thoughts about who's the Messiah, if he's living dead, or you know, you know the, whole, the whole ideas of Chabad, a little cuckoo for me, I would just say. And <coughs> I would like, um, so in that way, if there is an uh, active, let's say, and the strong Orthodox rabbi, that is the I was called the boss, but the rabbi that decides halakhically and deals with different questions. So I think Chabad can be a blessing to the community. But if there are places that Chabad and there are small communities that they do take over because they, they, the community does not want to invest or pay the salary of a rabbi and everything, so the problems start. And I think we have a good way of cooperating right now in Stockholm, but days will. <laughs> what will happen in the future. So this is a little bit about the communities, the challenges that are happening right now. Anti-Semitism in Sweden. So I heard Svimazel maybe would, was thinking to come. And um, I guess you all heard about the uh, exhibition and the funny part of that, that at the end of the day, Israel, you heard about the story with the ambassador and this, um, okay, so I won't repeat that, but the funny thing that is that at the end of the day, the embassy moved to the same museum for that this um, incident happened, and of course, I personally support it very much, as I said before, Ambassador Marzel, with whatever happened. Um, is this society anti-Semitic or not? So I would say absolutely not. Most Swedes are not anti-Semitic, and I travel around the whole country. I was in all the 25 different regions or states. I was up, I travel a lot because of kosher needs. So I'm familiar with the society, and um, I wouldn't say that the Swedes are anti-Semitic. However, their way of seeing things is very limited, I would say, in some way. And they always support the weak side. This is a Scandinavian way of seeing things, supporting the weak side. And I don't want to go back, maybe to go in too much to the history of Second World War, whatever happened there. But I guess I'm more expert than myself. But after the war, there's no doubt that Swedes helped the survivors, those that were sick, they couldn't continue on, there were a hundred, I don't know how many thousands, but there were many of them in Sweden in those days. And the main thought, that thought is generally that the Palestinians are the weak side. doesn't matter what is the reason, even if we start discussing logically what happened and why does these um, why, 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 what, what's happening in the Middle East, they're not so much interested in that. They're supporting automatically the weak side. I had one discussion with somebody, with an elder man, and he, he said, I love Jews, nothing with that. I have so many Jewish friends. But he said to me in a very strange way, I don't understand one thing. When the Germans lost the war, that was the thing I never heard, but I was astonished to hear that. When the Germans lost the war, so they, had, they were forced to give up a lot of a part of the territory of Germany to the different states, back to Poland, to Czechoslovakia, to Russia afterwards. I don't understand one thing he said to me. The Jews suffered from the Germans. 
the Jewish state should have been in Europe, part of Germany. This was his idea. I said, what? But at the end of the day, we have our historical background. The, we have Jews not only from Europe, we have Jews from uh, from the Middle East, we have Jews from America. Uh, Jews are living all around. What does that have to do? And we have our historical rights. This is our country. But honestly, I'm not interested in, in history. In history, different nations were in different places. For me, as a Swede, I'm not interested in those things. I know that the Jews from Europe help to build up the state. And if it would be only to the Jews that were in, around this area, we'd never have a state, a strong Israel like we have today. So I think that our state should be in somewhere in Europe, the Jewish state, and not. So this is the way of thinking, not thinking about historical rights, not thinking about, about um, what is right, what is wrong, supporting automatically the weak side. And this has to deal with different um, aspects in society there. I'll take a different example. It's totally different. They take, for example, the homosexual and lesbian question that is not so much dealt with in society in Israel, but there, the, in Sweden, I would say, when the Nordic country, especially, I would say that the gays, and they're very much supported and they are very much understood, and they're even mo most favorite people. And I will take one example we discussed a little bit before. Before, um, there was a Muslim, the Orthodox churches, the Muslims, and they called me and they asked me, are you willing to state that uh, the term of marriage would be kept only for the marriage between a man and a woman. Nothing to do with their rights in society. I didn't deal with that. It didn't matter. The term of marriage, to keep this word in Swedish Ekenskop, should be only between men and women. And I supported and the Orthodox churches and the Muslims. The day after, 39 of the, I would say, the leaders of the community, together with other people, said, oh, Rabbi Horton doesn't represent the Jews of Sweden. It doesn't matter that 4,000 4, Jews supported me and I started, they wanted to start a debate in the daily newspapers that I stopped automatically. A lot of people were upset, how can they attack me like in the paper? But this is part of the idea that the leaders do want to be part of society and society takes a stand that we should not, not affect in any way the weaker side. So is the society anti-Semitic? No. If they're dumb or they're not thinking in the right way or absolutely yes. There are laws that can be called anti-Semitic. On the other hand, we're talking about the law of Shkita that was brought up in the 30s and we know and it's still we're not succeeding to change it. And when I go to the parliament and I ask the same question again and again, now they agree to have post on cutting, meaning having after the Shkita, after the Shkita to do the, it's called in Swedish bedevning, meaning to shoot the animal or to do the anesthetic part after the Shkita. Now they agree about that. The debate is how many seconds afterwards. But uh, when I ask them the question, you're coming and focusing about small details, but when you or the king or whoever they go out to hunt, and nobody knows where this bullet will meet the animal, how long, how long is the animal suffering, and because this is part of the culture, you say yes, but what about, when I ask this question all the time, again and again, how can you forbid shkita, but you allowed, allowed hunting, we know that's a very cruel thing, the, the answer is always, it's not on our table now. <laughs> There's no logical, no logical um, answer about that. So we have these things that are, they can be called anti-Semitic, but on the other hand, I wouldn't say that most of the people are anti-Semitic. Today, the new government is not so much interested in foreign policy. That in Sweden, they're very much into economical questions. The questions about the 
through rights of, um, and it got to be a big thing in Scandinavia, that a lot of immigrants came in, about 5% of the society, I don't know how much in Norway, but in Sweden at least 5 to 7% are Muslims. Not all of them integrate. The Swedes aren't so open to accept them. They give them all the nice social benefits, but at the end of the day, they're not integrating into society. And I think the very much the society is dealing with these questions much more than foreign um, policy right now. The church, again, is the, I would say, the Swedish church, Lutheran church, is very much against, was against Israel in the last years. Now, the situation is more quiet, but was very anti or very negative in the last years. There are, of course, members of more Orthodox churches that support Israel, and we have contact with them. They support Kevin Kayemet and other organizations. But um, I would say the Swedish church isn't so um, positive to Israel. So if, before I conclude, I would say working in Sweden is an interesting challenge. It's a different culture, something that's not similar to the States or England or French or French because I think people you feel that the Jewish society was very much much more than other countries what are still under the shadow of the Holocaust they are it's difficult for the Jews to be proud Jews are very Zionist they're very active they're very nice but they, they're not they don't have this free way of expressing themselves as the Jews in the States or even in France are the more influence from the Jews from Morocco that are coming there. But on the other hand, it's a beautiful community to work with and I'm happy I was I had this challenge for the last 10 years that I'm there. I think it was a great experience to me and I would like to thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. We have time for discussion now if there's any questions, comments. Andrea, and this um, support for the weaker side, um, this seems to be a general thing across Europe. Um, I'd say you say it's not like Britain. What you're saying sounded very much like Britain at the public level, not at the level of you know the power brokers and decision makers, but at the, the general public. It sounded very similar. Um, is it different from the rest of Europe in any way, or is it just? A it's more extreme than more extreme. more extreme than Britain. Yeah, much more extreme. It's also Britain has as, uh, more connections to the states, and on the other hand, Sweden was a little always anti USA. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, please, Sharon Friedman, and then Ashley Perry. Um, clearly, the Jewish community has no political influence in Sweden. Is that correct? Yeah, no, not at all. Is there a conflict now between the growing Muslim community and the Jewish community in any way? Are there incidents of anti Semitism? Why there, is there pressure in any way that we know of another European community? Um, in the last year, we didn't notice this, but it was in the past. After the, the days of Chumat uh, Magen, as you could call it. So of course there were tougher days in Sweden. It was more dangerous to go around with the kippah, or not recommended at all. Um, there were demonstrations. I lived over the embassy, so we had to leave our house for a few um, times and moved to a hotel because of these demonstrations. There were incidents and there are incidents in the Jewish, um, there was before the Jewish school, but not too extreme. There was nothing, but we are aware all the time that um, things can happen, yeah. I have just one more question. Uh, the names of prominent Jewish families do not appear in this. Can you mention some of them? And are there in Sweden anything like large families, clans, or groups of families who are together, and the place of the Jews economically in the society, are they in the upper level, the middle level, are they, what, what kind of things do they do? Yeah. They're definitely in the upper level, and um, a lot of the Jews are well known also in society, in economics, in research, doctors, there were members of parliament, a lot of the 
famous professors and research and Jews are around in every place. The big families are a great influence in building Stockholm, different institutes, different, um, I would say the, the biggest publishing book um, is owned by a Jewish, old Jewish family that's not Jewish anymore. And there are a lot of tribes, big families that um, the name, they came in the beginning of the hundreds. So there are still Jews, there are, I would say, different tribes, yeah. I mean, Jews that have just name a few, I'm sorry. Like yeah. Nisel, Mankovic, there are different names in our... Wallenberg. Wallenberg? No, no, not Jewish in any way. No, no. all Wallenberg? No, because of the question of his alleged past, I just asked yeah. him. No, at all no. not. There were a lot of Jews that helped Wallenberg. No, there was talk and other that helped. Wallenberg, and, um, but he's not a Jewish Okay, thank you. Sorry. Well, we should, Wallenberg is. Raoul, sorry, the Wallenbergs are not. But Raoul's mother was a quarter Jew, which tremendously, which tremendously upset the Wallenbergs, who never wanted to have anything to do with Raoul. And I have that story because there is his niece, whom I whom I met, and she told me. She told me that story. Uh, Wallenberg's father died. Wallenberg's father was a diplomat, I believe, and he died before Raoul was born. Mm -hmm. And then the family really put the mother out. And this niece said she worked once in one of the banks, and when they found out, they fired her. Uh, so. The story, that Raoul certainly had a consciousness of, of uh, Judaism because of the, of the hostile attitude of his family. Mm -hmm. Just this story doesn't sort of confirm what you <coughs> indicated about lack of discrimination and lack of uh, prejudice in different levels. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Um, <coughs> how is it? Sorry, we have, oh, sorry. We have some questions. Oh, sorry. Ashley first and then 